So to help you understand what we're doing with virtual directory services, first I'd like to take you through a little bit about what we're doing with our identity management and management program first. So about three years ago, we started down this path of identity management. All of you here are here because you're identity people of some sort. You've either started down the path, already gone down the path, going down the path again. Uh, and so I, I don't need to spend too much time talking about what an identity management vision or process is or what a vision looks like. We all understand that. This is what we worked from when we deployed ours. Outside of that, there are really, when we're talking with the business and not talking about technologies, there's really three different things that make identity important to the bank. The first of those uh, that, that makes identity important uh, is the fact that we're a public company. So we're listed, uh, we have fiduciary responsibilities to our shareholders to make sure that we keep all of our resources inside the bank secured. So that's important to us. And as we all know, securing information inside of any corporation starts with understanding who you are, who you're working with, how you relate to other resources at the bank. So that's important. The second reason identity is important to Fifth Third uh, is that we uh, are a financial company. So we have things outside of the public corporate space that we have to deal with because we're a finance organization. So we've got additional regulatory controls that we have to deal with. Uh, and we have to do a number of additional audits uh, and internal risk reviews at regular intervals. A lot of those reviews revolve around entitlements, authentication, and authorization making sure the right people have access to the right things inside of the company. And the third reason that identity is important to the bank is we are a retail company, right? We, we're not in business just to be in business, we're in business to serve our customers. So those customers we found over time are actually pretty selfish. They only really care about their identities. If you're going into the bank to make a deposit, you really want that deposit to go into your bank account, not mine. Now, I'd like it to be in mine, but since we have to put your stuff with you, we need to make sure we know who you are. So that's important to the bank, and that's something that's easy to describe when we're talking with people of all levels inside the bank about why identity is important. We can talk about how it secures resources, but how it also helps us help our customers do the things that they need to do. So that's important. So there's those two types of customers that we talked about that we care about for identity. We talked about internal resources, securing who has access to what, right? What applications you're allowed to log into, what you're allowed to do inside those applications, but also the external customers and their identities. So as part of the program, we broke out identities and how we view them, and we tried to model uh, how we classified our identity stores inside the bank into these areas. So we found that there were, just as a, a legacy over time, things seemed to develop into these two areas. Uh, either there were internal identity stores, so there are places inside of the bank that held information about employees, there were external identity stores, and that was all the B2B and the business to business and business to consumer identity stores that stored information about our customers. The two, the types of information that were stored in each one were different. Inside the internal identity stores, we tended to know more about those identities. We tend to know more about our internal employees because we're allowed to ask them more questions and they have a vested interest to respond to those. Right? We know what benefits they get because if they don't tell us, they don't get benefits. Right? External identities is not quite the same thing for us. We found that separated out through the identity stores that different applications stored only information that they cared about. And that information tended to be more sparse. So people cared about different things that were important to them at that time. So that's important for us as we go through and talk about how virtual directory fits uh, those two types of identity stores that developed over time. Now on the slide before, I showed that the bank's been in business since about 18... 50-ish, so we've been around for a while. Uh, I always think it's funny when people talk about legacy systems. I come to these conferences pretty often, not just Digital Identity World, but some of the other trade shows, and I love hearing from companies that come up and tell me about how their legacy system that they deployed two years ago was a real hindrance on them because it doesn't support the latest technology. We've been around for 150 years. We have legacy systems you have no idea about. We still deal with typewriters, and even before that, I mean, we papers, and before that, it's just, it's crazy. So those identity stores evolved over time. Uh, that'll be important when we talk about virtual directories because those source systems uh, become more and more important because they're separated with needed information, uh, but less important because now we can get to them wherever they are. So some of the challenges that we dealt with as we were going through our identity management program uh, are listed here. I'm not going to go through each of them. We can all read. Uh, you know, we have to deal with things, uh, at least in terms of recent history, that are still exist. Things like mainframe integration, 
We have acquisitions that bring in new systems with new identity stores that we have to go through. Uh, we have to deal with server consolidation, business requirements, new applications, and all of that. But in addition to that, we also have to deal with the regulatory side of things. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Uh, as being a public company, we have to deal with things like, that most companies have to deal with that are listed, things like Sarbox, where we have to do certain amounts of reporting. We have to have internal controls over our systems. Uh, those all start at the identity management side. And then we have financial services specific issues that we have to deal with. Things like the Financial Modernization Act of 1999, uh, the Patriot Act for customer identification. Things where we have to demonstrate that we have an understanding and a relationship with a customer before we're allowed to do business with them. So those are additional constraints that we have to deal with and we have to understand as we go through our identity management program. So one of the other constraints we dealt with, and this is a common problem for businesses that go through this uh, identity management journey, is the idea of identity silos. Right? Most people, when they talk about identity silos, talk about, you know, I've got my Active Directory environment here, and it's got you know, all of my employees, and it's all listed in one place. And I, maybe I've deployed this Enterprise Directory over here, and it's got more of the same thing, and maybe some more information about those internal identities. And then I've got some of these other applications. That is, that is how people traditionally talk about silos, but at the bank we talk about it a little bit differently uh, because we're more concerned about not classifying the data, but understanding how we can get at it. We define silos a little bit differently. We break them up into three different groups when we think about it. The first one is uh, internal identity systems. So those are the systems that we deal with that are primarily deployed in the bank for identity services. So you'll see things listed in the silo like DB2 databases that have user records things like top secret RACF systems on the mainframe, things like Siebel and LDAP and Active Directory. Those internal systems are there primarily to provide identity services, at least holding those identities. On the other side of the spectrum, you've got external systems. So you've got things all in the far end, and these are the outsource relationships that we deal with at the bank. Things like HR providers that are outside of Fifth Third, uh, things like recruiters or collections companies that we have to deal with. These people have information about identities, about employees at the bank that log in and use their services, uh, but they're not owned or operated by the bank. So that's one of the other silos. And in between, we've got this idea of applications and devices. This is where most of the legacy systems that we deal with for identity sit. So these are things like COTS applications, um, homegrown applications that make the business run, all the stuff that's been built over the last 150 years that has identity information in it, that has applications in it, application data in it, that really make the business run. In terms of siloing, it's a, it was there and it was deployed as point solutions, but now as identity management, as a grandiose program has come about, we want to be able to provide that information and access that information through one common framework. So there's a play there for virtual directory services. In terms of the IDM stack that we've deployed, this is the picture. Uh, as they mentioned at the beginning, I am a uh, lead technology architect. And you can't be an architect anywhere unless you can draw pictures. So this is one of those pictures. There's a couple more pictures that prove that I'm an architect later that'll, that'll look far more impressive and confusing. But this is one that we use inside the bank whenever we're talking with some of our executives about what we've deployed at the bank. So this is our stack. You've got at the top, you've got the application. So this is the application layer. This is what we're all used to dealing with. These are sometimes are silos in the middle where they've got identity data themselves, but they may need to access other identity information that's further down in the IDM stack. Below that, there's the application access layer. Uh, that layer is the RSA ClearTrust layer or the directory adapters that we use, any common APIs, the services-oriented infrastructure that we've got in place things that are built, common interfaces that are built to access identity information. Below that, there's sort of the, the dotted line connection between the enterprise directory, our LDAP store, and virtual directory services that we have in place. It's labeled as our primary identity store. Uh, this is what we've got in place as our strategic direction for identity storage going forward. There's two components to it. There's Sun Directory, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then virtual directory services provided, at least at our company, by Radiant. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, too. Below that, you've got our provisioning services. Right now, that's run by BMC Control SA. Uh, this is the, we consider the back-end service that, obviously, there's a lot of presenters about provisioning services that can go into it in more detail. But this is where it sits on the stack. We, we tend to hide it from the rest of the applications. 
So talking a little bit about the directory hardware that we're talking about, so we can get through that and talk about the virtual directory services in more detail. In terms of the directory services hardware that we've got in place, we've, we use the Sun hardware sitting on E25Ks. We've got, uh, we've got that listed as our strategic source for identity. Now because we've got this virtual directory service uh, in the back end that lets us abstract some of the back end data stores and let data sit where it sits, we don't have to say that this is the one end all be all for directory services. We have stated that this is the strategic direction for identity storage at the bank. And anytime there's new identity information that's being stored or new applications being developed, the intent is first it will go here. So where does that sit? Where does that hardware sit? We've got three tier one data centers that we use at the bank and each of those sits one E25K, it, each one is a dual board process, and it's got uh, enough RAM and CPUs to run. We benchmark at 1,000 mixed operations per instance per second. So right now that's able to meet our needs uh, for the application load that it's dealing with. We monitor that very actively to make sure that as new applications come on board, that that's gonna stay within our tolerances. If we needed to add more hardware or more power, we would just augment by adding additional boards, putting more of the indexes in RAM, and moving on. Inside that same physical hardware sits the virtual directory services. It's all co-located. So the virtual directory services are deployed at the bank at the same level and at the same hardware in the same OS as the enterprise directory instances. So that virtual directory service looks like this. This is the, the logical architecture for VDS. This is another one of those architect pictures that I like to bring out, although I can't claim that I, I drew this one. I think this was from training material that we got from Radiant while we were going through that process. For people who aren't familiar with virtual directory services, specifically Radiance, we can talk a little bit about what's involved here. At the very top of it, uh, there's the virtual directory engine. This is the service that provides the caching and the virtual directory core components for this service. Now we'll talk a little bit in a minute about what that service does for us, but at the core there's this component that runs this virtual directory concept. Below that, you've got uh, RDMS connectors that go to this pitchfork-like connectors to all your different applications. So you've got directories, databases, applications. All of those things get scooped up by the virtual directory and can be presented by that to other systems. So we should talk just for a minute about what virtual directory services means to us at the bank. A lot of people talk about virtual directory services in terms of when they hear virtual, they just think of real-time data access. And that's important, and that's true. You can use virtual directories to access non-directory data uh, or even directory data real-time without having to move it around. Sometimes it's being presented as in contrast to traditional meta directories, right, where you're syncing the data or, or moving the data around. And that's true, too. That's a service virtual directories can do, uh, but it's not the only thing it's for. When we talk about virtual directories at the bank, we talk about it in terms of abstracting the data. Application teams don't care about where the data is. They don't care that application data may be sitting in an old repository, and they don't care that that data may not sit in a directory that can be accessed with X500 LDAP, uh, or you know, they don't care if it's JDBC calls. They don't care, they just want the data. But what's important is on the back end, since they're different, deployed at different times, we need to be able to make that common across those data elements, uh, across those storage systems, so the applications can just say what they need. Right, I need identity information. I need to know who the customers are that meet this criteria. I need to know if they're a high net worth customer. Right, so they don't care about the back end. This lets us abstract that, take the data elements as they are in the repository, and move them around and manipulate them as we see. So we defined four use cases for virtual directory services at the bank. Uh, those are listed here, and you can read through all of the fine grained detail that's there, but it boils down to four categories. Uh, the first category is directory joins. Uh, this is the case that you can use virtual directories uh, to join two directory type objects or services or identity stores and make them into one logical system. More and more applications, especially commercial off-the-shelf applications, are starting to understand that directories are out there and that people are using them. You know, it's about time, it's only been 10 years. Uh, but they don't understand in large enterprises that sometimes that information sits in multiple directories. So what we do with virtual directories is in the case where two directories are needed and we need to combine, merge that data, we can use virtual directory services to do that. So that's the first acceptable use case that we have. That's directory joins. Protocol masking or external joins is another acceptable use case. Uh, this is one where we'll talk about two specific production examples uh, a little bit later that we went through at the bank uh, that we do. 
protocol masking has more to do when the backend system isn't a directory or isn't a good directory provider. And we can use virtual directories to access that data as if it were a directory. So masking that protocol on the back end and abstracting that data is an acceptable use that we found come up more times than not. Schema transformation is the third one, third acceptable use. This is cases where uh, legacy systems have named things in different ways. Uh, 150 years of history, people have gone through different naming structures and applications. Depending on who is developing it, sometimes people said it's first name, comma, last name for username, sometimes last first, sometimes first initial, last name, sometimes they transverse it, or sometimes they just pick a random number. So defining that data differently is fine as long as the attribute that's storing it is the same. VDS allows us to map those attribute names so that we can get to that data where it is as it is. So that's another acceptable use case for virtual directories at the bank. And then the last one is external data masking. Uh, this is one that's helped us, especially when we start talking about some regulatory controls that we have to deal with and data security controls that we have in place. External data masking allows us to access systems that don't have fine-grained access control on the back end, but we want to access that data. So that data may need to be secured on the back end, but how we access it, the interfaces that are available don't allow us to control that. So when you start, start talking about external data masking, it means that we can make a call at the application level saying, give me everything about this user, and it only return the defined attributes that are in the view. These are things that you can do inside of directory services natively with access control lists, but when you start dealing with non-directory providers, it's not something that's there. So virtual directory lets us apply those directory type access controls in that same place. So synchronization versus virtualization. Uh, we talked a little bit about the difference between the two. When you start going down the path of, of virtual directory services, uh, you'll, I suspect that you'll find yourself in the same boat we were a while ago, trying to understand what you would do when. So at the time, we thought it was really important and spent a lot of time trying to understand when we would synchronize the data and when we would virtualize the data. Now, I don't like the term virtualization anymore when I'm defining dynamic access. And this is sort of an evolving concept that I'm still struggling with. I'm, I'm so used to saying virtualization meaning dynamic access, but talking with some of the other uh, Radiant and some of the other providers in the space, they're starting to help me understand that virtualization is much more than that. So where it says virtualization, it should really say dynamic real-time access. We spent a lot of time trying to understand when it's right to leave data where it is and when is it better to move it. And where we, we came up with these rules, we would synchronize data whenever the source of authority was either unstable, unresponsive, or the data was very static. Right? It made sense to us to move the data in that case to get us to that holy grail identity store. And that makes sense. We can still use that as a rule. And then we use dynamic access for everything else, especially things that are latency sensitive. And that latency sensitivity control, that rule, is more important to us than unresponsive or unstable. So if something needs to be real time, even if the backend can't support it, we would tend towards real time access. Just because the data rule is more important than the backend system, at that point, we would say, if that's true, fix the backend system, and we'll get to it then. Now, we spent a lot of time trying to understand when's the right time to do this data move. And what we've discovered, if there's one thing that you take away from the talk that I'm giving today is this. It, it doesn't matter when you move the data. It doesn't matter when you access it in real time. Right? What matters when you go down the path of virtualization and virtual directory services, what matters the most is that you choose a product that lets you switch between the two when the business needs it to. A lot of virtualization is trying to, trying to access and keep and use data stores where they are. But what we get lost in is we're in that point in time trying to understand how do I get at this data that's in this database, is that at some point that's going to change. Right? Inside the bank, things weren't always on the mainframe, and now things are starting to go on open systems. That data is going to move when the application team is ready to move it, and that data is going to change when the provisioning services mature enough in our organization to move that data and keep it up to date. I don't want to have to go back and redo the entire integration just because I need to switch from meta directory right, solutions to real-time access. What we found is the product that we selected is very good at doing that, so we sort of backed into the right product. It wasn't something that we considered early on, but it's something that if we were going to go back and do a new virtualization project and try to understand what's the right tool to use, 
one of the first questions I would ask is what happens when the backend data store changes and I need to switch from meta to real-time access or real-time to meta, right? What's involved with that? How much time does it take? How hard is it? What's the outage time? Those kind of questions I think are more important than trying to understand when do I do it for this point in time. So that's that soapbox that I've got planned for that speech. Also, there's a question, I think, in the evaluation for the presentation where it asks you, you know, what's the one thing you took away from this? That's what you should put down for that if you choose to write that is ask those questions, okay? I'm looking for that. You'll be graded on it later. So let's talk about some real stuff, right? Let's talk about what we've done at the bank. So far, I haven't told you anything more than we had this identity management program and we drew some pictures, right? I haven't told you about how we're using it to help our business, and I haven't told you about how it's helped us with some regulatory controls and concerns that we've had with our data sets. So let's get into that. One of the projects that first came on and used virtual director service of the bank was this B2B portal that we had. Here it's listed as B2B single sign-on. We've got this application at the bank where it's a, a single portal called 53 Direct where business customers of ours come in. There's about 200,000 of them uh, that use the application. And they log in and they do the types of things that businesses do with banks. The application was developed before there was really strong portal software. It's really just a homegrown application that, that sits a bunch of applications at the back end into one portal. <clears throat> There's no common login between it. You log in once and you get into the direct application. Uh, but then once you get inside of that, depending on what you want to do, you're actually going to each of those different applications in the back end. And it's being presented to you uh, through a common interface. That's great, except what we found is that all the customers, depending on when they were going to do something, transfer money, add new users, uh, you know, do those sorts of things that businesses do, uh, they had to log in several times. They may use different IDs each time. And the back end system may get them locked out of one, but not all the other systems. So as part of the identity management program, there are a few projects that were listed early on as being early adopters for this new great service that we we're bringing out. B2B single sign-on was the first one. What we needed to do in the back end was take advantage of some of the services that virtual directories can do, things like directory joins, protocol masking, uh, external data masking, schema transformations, the whole gamut, right? So we were really excited about it being an early adopter because there were so many back-end systems that it touched. There was data on the back-end. The primary data store, identity store for the service was a RACF system in the mainframe. I'm not a mainframe guy. I'm an open systems guy. So we always called it a closed system. On the closed-end side, there was all this information we needed to get. VDS was our can opener for that. So what, what do we have to do? What, what was the answer, right? How do we get single sign-on for this homegrown application? How do we access it and the different data stores using virtual directory services? Uh, how do we get that and give this good customer experience for logging into the applications? So here's one of those architect pictures I was telling you about uh, that, that impresses people, at least at the bank. Uh, I actually don't put this in presentations anymore when I go to senior executives because at one meeting, uh, I actually had to sit down and talk through each of the points. They thought if it was important enough to put in the presentation, we should sit down and talk through each of the different lines that went through it. So I guess he's taught me a lesson. Uh, it's a lesson I haven't learned because I'm not going to go through this entire picture in this. We don't have the time. What this shows, though, is what a single sign-on solution would look like for an open systems deployment. So there's a lot more going on here than virtual directory services, a lot more going on here than directory services. Uh, but <clears throat> a lot of this is how ClearTrust works. So the guys are here from RSA, and they can talk to you about how a ClearTrust login looks. Uh, I put it in the slide because I think they're giving the presentations out to all the attendees. And if you go through this slide, I think it's, a, it's an attached Visio document, you can see what a transaction looked like if you just follow the numbers. So there's a one, there's a two, follow transaction. You'll see what actually is going on on the ClearTrust side. Right? But we're not talking about clear trust. We're talking about virtual directories and directory services. So we're only going to talk about one corner of it, right? the top corner where we're talking about what that identity store is that's being used for that login. So clear trust needs to use, as, a, as an access solution, it needs to have a back-end system that it can store its entitlement information in. It needs to have a back-end system that has the users in it. So clear trust was deployed prior to the identity management program at the bank, but also in conjunction with it. So when it was deployed, it was deployed as the first customer of the directory services proper. So the ClearTrust entitlement store existed in the enterprise directory. 
So the Clear Trust service accounts, the bind accounts, all of that information is in the directory, the Sun Directory services. Now for the B2B portal that we're talking about, that's a legacy identity store that existed prior to any of these deployments, and it's in a RACF system on the mainframe, specifically top secret. So it's all of there. Now what we're talking about here and how we use virtual directory services to solve this problem could be true for anything, not just this one application that I'm talking about. Right? It could be true for any portal application, any web application, really anything that's secured using a clear trust, an integrity site minder, any of that, anything that's tokenized, tokenized and used for security, it could all be the same thing because the picture looks the same. There's nothing on this picture or even the one before that says, you know, this mainframe application, right? It's any application that's secured using tokens. So what, we, what we've done is we need to access this directory store. The directory services inside of it, uh, we'll go through on the next couple slides what the transactions look like and what the data is and where it sits. But there's a couple things we should talk about first, right? We're going to talk about what we did and how it works. But before that, we should talk a little bit about why we did it, right? So why not just move the data, right? That's something we should talk about. Anytime you get into a virtual directory discussion, you should ask yourself, why aren't I moving the data, right? Why not just move it? Why have this additional layer of complexity in your system? Right, so there's, there's really three reasons why we didn't want to move the data, and this ties back into some of the regulatory things we were talking about earlier, and really probably one of the biggest benefits that isn't discussed a lot about virtualization. The three reasons we didn't want to move it are first, time, second, cost, and third, regulatory controls. Right, on the cost and time side, it breaks down into you have to change a lot to move an identity store. Right? You have to change how provisioning is going ongoing, right? how the new accounts are added for businesses. All of that is custom code, right? if you, especially for data stores that have existed for years. The other side of it is startup costs, right? that one-time migration. Outside of the ongoing costs, there's time and cost with moving those data elements. Right? It's, it's in a RACF system, which doesn't translate well to an open system. So you have to move all that data. So that's time and cost. The third, regulatory, and that's really important. It's something that you should think about even if you're not a finance institution, for why virtualization can help you. Right? If you're leaving the data, the identity information, in the system that it's in now, a legacy system, also known as a system that's been working for a long time without issues, it's gone through the regulatory controls already. It's been audited. It's a secure system. Right? It's already gone through that. It already meets mustard. It, it's already good enough to do that. If I move that data, if I change the system, if I make that data go somewhere else, Right now, I have to go through all of that again. So as long as your systems are secure enough to pass audit now, you can leave it there, still access it in the way you want, but have the data sit where it sits now, and save yourself all of those headaches and all of that cost. Right, so that's something you should think about as you're going through a virtualization is there are benefits to having distributed identity. In some of the earlier keynotes, they talked about you know, this idea of the holy grail used to be bring it all together, right? That's not true anymore. The data is where it is. And that's okay, right? We can leave it there as long as we can access it in the way that we want, in the time that we want, in, in a secure fashion. So we use virtual directories to get to that. So let's talk about what a virtual directory, what the connection points are for that type of login. For people who haven't done anything with virtual directory services yet, I'd encourage you to talk with some of the vendors that are here for that. They can go through what it looks like, how you create a view, Right? How do you define the schema? How do you define those common elements? How do you get at that data? They can go through that probably more effectively than I, and certainly then you have enough time and interact with them to understand what it looks like. But at a high level, what you're doing is you're going to go ahead and define the view. Right? You're going to say, this is the data store. This is how you access it. This is what elements are there. You'll export all of that. You'll define what's important, what you're allowed to see, how you're allowed to see it. All of that gets created when you create that view into that remote store, when you define that common schema. So you'll do that. Once you've got that view, what does a clear trust transaction look like? Right? What it looks like just from that directory corner, right? not all of the other messiness that was in the earlier picture. There's four things that happen with the clear trust login. And this happens in production all the time, right now, today, in production for the bank. There are four things that happen. right? Anytime a customer goes to direct, a bind request that comes from the single service, single sign-on service account, authenticating itself as a valid user of the directory store so it can access the entitlement information. It searches the entitlements, does its clear trust things to see if it's a valid user. There's smart rules that are there, lots of other things that it can do. 
And then after that, it'll do a search for the requesting user, make sure that they're there before it then binds as that user, finally checking those credentials. So as we take those four transactions through the login sequence and touch the different components in that IDM stack that we showed earlier, what hits what where? So the first thing you're going to hit in the IDM stack when you're doing the first and second transaction of those four is you're going to hit our enterprise directory components. So you're going to hit the Sun directory service. You're going to hit the proxy server. The proxy server is going to take those transactions and send them on to the backend directory server. The directory server, the schema for the directory server is broken out by channel for us. So we've got B2E separated from B2C and B2B. We also have this fourth branch for virtual directory services that we'll talk about in just a minute. So those first two transactions, since ClearTrust was deployed into the directory service, right? It was there's there's no virtual directory, there's no external store for it. It's deployed in the directory. All those transactions take place inside of the directory server. So the directory server is going to find the ClearTrust bind account, and it's going to check the entitlement store all inside of there. There's no virtual directory. <laughs> now it is possible to have virtual directory services front end the whole thing, right? And and that's a deployment that they suggest in some cases where you don't do first a connection to the directory and then go back to the, direct, the virtual directory server. This is how we deployed it. To be fair, we did do this two or three years ago, so we didn't have the benefit of other people's experience. In retrospect, it might have been better to go ahead and keep everything in one component, but three years ago, virtual directory services weren't as well established as they are today. So in order to minimize impact to the bank, if there were an outage, we wanted to make sure that ClearTrust as a whole was using a more solid technology. We've seen now that it's proven enough that we probably can go ahead and switch that and give a common interface, a common point of entry to the directory services for ClearTrust, which put it all to the virtual directory. But this is how it is now. This is how we're in deployment now. This is what's working in production now, so we haven't changed it. <clears throat> so then there's those, those other two steps that need to happen, steps three and step four, where we're actually looking for that user store. Remember, the user store is in top secret, right? So we need to hit the virtual directory services. The virtual directory services will go ahead and hit back to a routing layer that exists inside of the Radiant product that takes us back to, again, our directory server. Now, this directory server, when it's accessed through the virtual directory system, includes, consolidates all of the components that have been added from those virtual directory views. So we've got that, that last branch, that O equals VDS on the far side, and under that is really the top secret identity store, the RACF identities. Those identities are all there and they look like directory entries. So when ClearTrust is going to this user repository that's defined, as far as it knows, it's just talking to another directory server. It's doing a lookup for the user. It finds the user and then binds. It just issues the same commands it's used to. So those transactions go through and everything's fine. The user gets in, he is on with his life. He goes to the application. Cookies get generated. When they move between one application to another inside of it, ClearTrust does its ClearTrust thing, validates the cookies, sends the cookies on, and does all of that, which is great. So at that point, that mainframe login process is now an open systems cookie-based login. <laughs> so that's one application that we've been using in production for about a year. It's not really one application. It's not really fair to call it that. It's really a group of applications. But that's one deployment. A second deployment, and probably a more common one going forward for us, is anytime we need to use ClearTrust for cross-silo authentication. Now, what does that mean? I talked earlier about the silos, right? We had the three silos, identity systems, application systems, and external providers. <clears throat> anytime that you have an application that needs to access the internal identity stores for applications, but not, and, and then an external system or an application system for its user lookups, Right, we would use this. We use WebSphere um, application servers for all of our J2E apps. So one thing that we've found that, that's happened to us quite a few times is those J2E apps need to be secured, right? Not unusual, right? We're a large company. We have those needs for identity to secure things. We also have regulatory needs to secure things. So the application needs to be secured. The application gets secured through ClearTrust in this case using TAIs, right? Trust interceptors. So anytime a user is going to log in to the application, we want that login to occur and get passed from WebSphere onto the TAI to ClearTrust to move on. The challenge that we've come across that VDS has helped us with is cases where the employees, right, the administrators of the applications 
don't exist in that external identity store. One of the limitations that we run into with WebSphere is that you define that directory location for securing your applications. That's one directory location. And then there's uh, for console logins or lockouts. So to secure the WebSphere console, it's an application for itself. So there's the container inside of it that gets secured, and then there's the actual application server. The actual application server needs to be secured using a different identity store. The challenge is WebSphere doesn't let you do that. It doesn't let you say, for this application, for console logins, use this, and then for this application, use something else. What happens is there's a TAI, the trust interceptor, uh, that gets called for those application logins. But what they don't tell you in the documentation for WebSphere is that before WebSphere will pass a customer login or an employee login, an application login through the container to the trust interceptor, the first thing it's going to do is do a search for the user to see if it's in that administrative domain that you've defined. So the challenge is you need to have some sort of VDS, some sort of combined solution or some sort of interception capability to say a console user is a valid user to get onto the console even though they're not a valid user to use the application. There's no way to do that natively inside of the J2E application server. So we use virtual directory services to intercept those logins. And inside of at least the Radiant product and a few of the others, you can add additional code and logic to say, during an authentication, do a couple of things. Right? So do the normal things that you do for a lookup. But then if you don't say find the user because you're going to that external system that has the customers, go ahead and pass the user. Right? Go ahead and let them do the login anyway. Let ClearTrust fail it instead of failing it by not finding that employee to begin with. I hope that makes some sense. It's something that if you go through and find yourself doing an integration where you need to secure your J2E consoles and your identity system is different than for customers for the application is different than the administrative users, hopefully you'll remember that crazy guy from the bank that said, hey, you need to do something else because there's a random search that happens. Right? It's something you can look at. There's a search that happens, and VDS helps us get that search through. So some design points, some lessons learned. What, what have we learned going through this process? The number one thing we learned, at least from the virtualization side, is that virtualization of the identity, abstracting that information, being able to leave that information in the system where it resides, is a very powerful tool that lets us get past some regulatory controls that we would have to deal with if we move the data. Right? This goes back to that one lesson I wanted you to hear or take away or learn, is it's, it's OK to leave that data there. Any approved data source can be used for SSO. That's really powerful when you start doing single sign-on and reduced sign-on initiatives. Right? You're not tied anymore to a directory or a single directory or have to have different SSO instances put in place. You can use your same single sign-on infrastructure and use multiple identity stores and, can and put them into one big blob without actually touching it. One of the other things that we learned is that you can remove application sequencing dependencies. This is something we didn't talk about too much today, uh, but it is something that you should hear. Since you don't have to move identity stores when you're doing application work, you, they're not the same thing. right? If you're doing identity management work, right? if you're taking identity stores, consolidating them, securing them, doing work with those, that's different than when you do application work. Right? In large companies, it's different. Right? We have different development teams that do application development than we do do identity management development. Using virtual directory, we don't need to have when it, one of those middle silo applications does work. We don't have to do it all at the same time. Right? If they want to upgrade their systems, well, they can leave the identity stuff there, leave that data there, and we can still get at it the same way we used to for the linked systems without having them be dependent upon us. So they can leave it or take it, and we can get to it wherever they do. So we separate those development timelines. The last thing that we learned, and there's a few other points there, uh, the, the last, one of the last things that we learned that's really useful for us when you go back to the synchronization versus uh, real-time access, what we learned with the virtual directories is that real-time access is possible. It is possible for a lot of systems. In fact, all of our deployments at the bank use real-time dynamic access with very minimal overhead. We haven't seen a large hit in terms of access times because of that virtualization layer. We measure very closely <clears throat> what it takes and what the changes are when we move application data. We have not seen a significant hit using real-time access, which goes back to why we say our first and default assumption is real-time dynamic access. So that's something that we learned. <clears throat>
So that's what I got. That's our virtual directory world. We've been using it pretty well for two years. I, I can say, although I'm hesitant to say this because I have my phone turned off right now, is we haven't had any outages with virtual directory services or identity management stack that have affected our services since we deployed two years ago. I probably shouldn't have said that because now my phone's going to start ringing. But for us, it started out as a big question mark, right? We weren't sure. We were new, early adopters. Radiant was all over us. Sun was all over us because we knew new stuff. I, I'm confident now from what we've seen that we're going to continue to use these virtual directory services and continue to look for ways to help abstract our identity stores in the back end to make that identity information a separate product, a separate service at the bank. And we've already seen some of the benefits from that. We've seen deployment times increase. We've seen a lot of application frustrations with getting at that data decrease. It's been a real benefit for us, and we're hoping to, to use that more in the future. So that's our story. That's virtual directories, and that's how it's helped us. Right? So in the question was, what, what kind of specific regulatory audit requirements have come to us in terms of identity management? Right? And one of, the, one of the big things that we go through every year inside of banking is we have to go through an annual employee entitlement review. Right? So we have to be able to say with certainty who's able to do what with certain applications. At some point, it will be all applications. But we need to be able to say who has access to what, when, where, and sometimes what they've done in the past. In terms of virtual directory services, we've not had a need to be involved with those types of questions yet because of the nature of virtual directory services. Right? One of the benefits that we wanted to talk about in terms of regulatory controls with virtual directory isn't that virtual directory services solve Sarbox problems or solves you know, Patriot Act problems. Right? It's certainly a tool that could be used by the business to do some data mining and find out who has access to what across identity systems. Right? But that hasn't been a need yet. What we have found is that because of the regulatory, regulatory controls, there were limitations being put on the business for how quickly we could do things because we had to talk to the legal teams. We had to talk about how we're securing that data. So as soon as you're able to say, we're not touching it, we're accessing it, and then can show that it's secure, right, we get around a lot of those questions. And we think that's a pretty powerful tool. So, you know, how, how do we actually get this stood up? You know, what, what was the, the timelines like? And what was the work effort like to get this out? Um, I can, the, the virtual directory components were deployed at the same time as the enterprise directory component. Uh, I was the lead architect for those components of the IDM program. There was another group that was involved specifically with provisioning and updating that. The, both the IDM components that I was responsible for and my team worked on uh, were deployed from the PMP initiate phase, the start of the project, to deployment production. That was a six month effort for us, which is pretty fast, especially for a large company. So that meant that we had product in place in production with at least one customer using it. And by customer, I mean internal customer. The project team for the directory side and the virtual directory side varied depending on where we are and what phase of the project we were at, from two to about six people. Those six people were never full-time employees working on it. There were probably two FTEs that were deployed at about 80% throughout, and then the rest were subject matter experts brought in because of the, some of those external identity stores. They were involved in the project integrating those. In terms of determining which ones went first in the sequencing, right? first thing we did is, uh, this was more of an IDM specific, how we got the program done, was uh, we drew a line in the sand. Right? We said, we've got a bunch of identity stores out there. They're not meeting our needs because they're on different systems. They're mainframe, RACF, they're Active Directory, and the limitations we had with AD three years ago in terms of scale. Right? This was going to be customer facing, five million customers. Use Microsoft there, are you serious? Right, those kind of things. We deployed what we considered enterprise class. So we drew that line in the sand and deployed that system and stood it up. In terms of what applications went first, there was quite a bit of rigor around that. Uh, because we're a bank, we like to get really behind processes and, <clears throat> and controls around that. And that's not just because we like processes and control and like to be stodgy, but we get audited on that as well. So when the Fed Reserve comes in, they ask us about our IT controls. They ask us, have we followed process? Do we have a defined procedure for that? So we did have a very, a very involved procedure for determining what applications went first, the sequence, what the risks were, what kind of controls were in place for that. That process did take quite a bit of time. In terms of pure technology work, that was probably a smaller, very small fraction of what it took to stood up uh, the VDS components. The, the, the type of technology that's there and how it is out of the box is pretty mature if you're into that identity management space and can speak directory. It's all there. And we did get a lot of support from the vendor on that. Most of the work for those six months was processed around determining who would go what, where, and when. Smoke. Right, so there's a number of components, a lot of moving parts with the identity management system. In terms of 
there, we didn't talk about each individual process or each individual server that's involved there. We did say there's three uh, directory servers in production. There's a few stage and development systems as well. We have had, we have not had any faults inside of our virtual directory layer of any component in production. We have not had any service faults for virtual directory or directory. The only production issue that we've ever experienced which didn't have any kind of customer impact was one of our proxy layer systems uh, had, had hung for about two seconds before it was picked up by the network as being non-responsive. Uh, that type of fault, uh, depending on how you measure it, and this gets into some of the Six Sigma work that we do, doesn't show up as a fault because there were no customer experienced impacts because the network layer was able to route those transactions separately using some of the 3DNS work that we do in network tricks. So we, hadn't had any, we haven't had any service faults during that time. We have had one component fault for about two seconds, which didn't have a customer impact. But that goes back to normal how you do, that, that's not specifically, that doesn't have to be which vendor you choose, although we think that's important, choosing the right vendors. It's how you deploy it, right? So we have deployment concerns that we went through as part of the architecture for what happens when any component fails, right? So making sure you've got the normal high availability set up is what, what helped us there. I, I'm a big fan of Federation, um, both in terms of concepts, but also the federated identity when you start dealing with internal federation and external federation. When I had those, si those silo picture up, where there was the external identity stores over there, that's actually a slide from another presentation that we had done inside the bank where we talked about how we're using federation for, with our external and outsourcing and some of the other B2B customer relationships we have. So we have B2B relationships that we have at the bank that don't use virtualization but do use federation to use some of our internal identity stores to, to access those outside providers. Right? When you're a company of our size, there's a lot of those relationships. When we talk about B2B at the bank, we generally talk about B2B as we're a supplier. Right? We don't usually talk about it in terms of some B2B relationships we have with our providers to then in turn combine provide to that end customer. But we do do federation for that and we do have a lot of combinations where we use different components of our IDM stack to get at that. And we've been pretty successful. I think we have, I want to say 13 federated identity, identity partners right now which I think is a lot for what the state of the industry is. Delegated administration isn't something that we've gotten into. Uh, at least I've not had a lot of work done on that side of things, uh, especially when we start talking about this. There are, we do have delegated administration when we talk about self-service capabilities that does impact information in the identity management state. So we do have delegation of some management rights for BDE side of things. So we give managers tools that exist and let them modify information about their customers and their hierarchy, their employees. Right, so that kind of delegation exists for identity, but not in terms of like higher level than that where we're delegating administration beyond that. We still have to have central control of who has general access to applications and application data. That still needs to be, because of regulatory controls, needs to be secured by a party that is disinterested in the use of that data. Right, so you have to have an outside person delegate control for those applications because of some of the things that we have to deal with as a financial service industry. So we can't delegate that, but we can delegate identity management control um, using some of those tools and some of the interfaces we've exposed.